The topic for Unit 3.3 is Evolutionary Developmental Biology, which is also affectionately, uh, kind of as a shorthand, known as EvoDevo. Um, it's a rather new field. Uh, it combines both classical embryology and the study of ontogeny, uh, so we'll come to that definition in a little bit, with modern molecular work and also new techniques that allow us to visualize development at the molecular level. So we'll be looking at all those elements today. So like many fields of biology, it really has a rather short history. Um, but unlike some fields, if the roots go way, way back into classical embryology, going all the way back to some of the earliest biological writings in the time of the Greek philosophers. So in the mid 20th century, scientists discovered a class of mutations that they called homeotic mutations or homeotic transformations. And these were changes that although uh, yielded mutant phenotypes, they did not look um, unusual in the fact like, you know, something that they had never seen before or something that was like a tumor or something completely um, unseen in the history of animals. So two examples. Uh, one of them is mutations that result in extra um, versions or extra numbers of something that's already there. So here we have a homeotic mutation in a mouse where they have an extra vertebra, which is very unusual. The number of vertebra is usually very, very conserved, and all mice um, typically have the same vertebra. But every once in a while, there'll be an extra or a number of extra vertebra. And again, this is not like a tumor or something unusual. It's just too many of something that should be there. Another example here is a mutation in a gene, Drosophila. The gene is called Proboscopedia. I'm sorry, this one's Antenopedia, and it's called Antenopedia because of the mutant phenotype. So in organisms with a mutation in this gene, they grow feet, pedia, that's the last part of that word, where their antenna should be. And so again, they look like smaller versions of the normal legs that occur on Drosophila. So it's not something completely unusual, it's just in a different location. And we're going to actually give both of these uh, names as we move on, these types of homeotic mutations. Okay. One of the very most famous kind of encapsulating statements about EvoDevo is this. This is one of my favorite statements. Um, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. If you ever want to say sound really nerdy or uh, make people run away from you at a party, you can just look at them and stare deep, deeply into their eyes and say ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. A lot of big words there. But just to make sure you understand what this means, and then we'll look at the diagram here, which is kind of illustrating this. So ontogeny is the technical term for embryological development. right? So it's that period of time between fertilization and birth or hatching if you are uh, developing in an egg. Now, really what we're looking at when we're talking about ontogeny is just the first one-third of that developmental process, right? So um, after that first third, like the first trimester in humans, what's going on is really just some final development, but not really detailed development, and then, of course, uh, growth. And so really we're talking about going from a fertilized egg, right, right at the very beginning, to a fully formed organism. And really that is primarily in the first third of development for most organisms, okay? Recapitulates is just a fancy way of saying, you know, goes over again or redoes. And then phylogeny, you already know. So this, in a nutshell, is saying that as we look at the developmental stages of organisms, in some ways, we are kind of reviewing or going back over their phylogenetic history. So for example, at stage one, vertebrate embryos, so here we have an amphibian, a reptile, and a mammal, all look quite similar. At stage two even, you know, if you didn't know something about the development of these organisms, you would not be able to look at this embryo down here at the bottom and say, oh, that's a developing mammal. In fact, this one's a human versus the reptile versus the frog. They all look very, very similar at these early stages. And so we can see kind of the history and all the characteristics. So a human embryo at this stage has these folds in the uh, cervical area right behind the, the head that in many organisms become gills. In fact, they're called the gill folds. In humans, these get uh, worked and reworked into becoming the pharyngeal um, support structures, sorry, the um, cartilaginous support structures, structures around your pharynx. Uh, they have a fairly 
pronounced postanal tail. Again, this is absorbed and becomes our, our vestigial coccyx. And there are other features also that make uh, early human embryo look a little bit more like our ancestral forms than our modern derived and very uh, uh, different um, adult. Okay, so just be aware of that term. Make sure you know what it means. Now, we're going to be looking at a couple of the changes that result in these homeotic shifts or homeotic mutations that we were talking about earlier. Uh, one is called heterochrony. So heterochrony literally from the Greek means hetero different and chrony like in chronological timing. So a change in the timing of development. And you've got a list of four different changes that can occur. I don't care that you memorize these or spend time learning them. We are going to look at an example of one of them. So we'll look at um, pedomorphism versus via neoteny here in a little bit. But realize that all of these are just simple changes in when events occur or how long a developmental process takes. So recapitulation via acceleration here is where we have a step in the process that speeds up dramatically, right? So step two takes a really, really short time. We go from step two to step three in a much shorter period of time than we normally would. And so if that occurs, that could or will result in something very simple like, oh, we're gonna hatch or be born earlier. Or it could mean that if we have other developmental processes that are going on these that don't change their timing, we might have a change in the way the organism looks because of this speeding up of development. Another one is where we simply truncate. So this is pedomorphism via progenesis, and we're going to look at a very famous example of this here in a little bit. So we truncate a developmental process, and you end up with a very different looking end result than you would if you went through these, these uh, other steps. And then you can look at these others. This is one where we really elongate a process, uh, and one where we have a, uh, a process where um, organisms mature at a much earlier stage than they would uh, otherwise. Now, all of these heterochronic events are really just mutations, and they can actually be rather simple mutations if we have a change at the right genetic location. It can result in a dramatic change in development, and this is key for these homeotic mutations because, um, and we'll look at the genetic, some of the genes that are involved in this process, but because of the genetic underpinnings of development, if you make a tiny mutation in the right gene, a very important early developmental gene, you can have a massive shift in the way that our organisms look. And so people realized that this was key to understanding many of the mutations that led to new uh, types of organisms or organisms that could do things their ancestors couldn't. And so these little changes can have a much bigger effect on the organisms in which they occur than many other types of mutations. So these are really key to understanding the evolution of organisms. But really they're just like any other mutation that changes the phenotype. And if you remember, if you change the phenotype, most likely you're going to have an impact on fitness. And the vast majority of these mutations are detrimental. So I'm going to go back two slides. So having an extra vertebra is very often a debilitating uh, phenotype. Having legs in place of your antenna does not work out well for the flies that carry that. The only way they survive is, survive is if they're very carefully looked after in the lab. In the real world, those organisms would die. And so the vast majority of these mutations are going to be negative, detrimental. Organisms don't do well. They don't pass on the genes, or at least not at very high frequencies. And eventually, those would be eliminated from populations by natural selection. But every once in a while, one of these heterochronic or uh, other mutations, these homeotic mutations might actually result in a beneficial outcome. And when that occurs, we get a new type of an organism that might even in, with one mutation be dramatically different than other members of its species. And so in theory, a single mutation could result in an entirely new type of organism. And then with you know further uh, reinforcement of that, a, a very rapid speciation event. So here's one example of this that seems to have resulted in this very dramatic shift in with just one small change, pedomorphism via neoteny. Now in layman's terms, this means looking like a juvenile, that's pedomorphism, via neoteny, which is a delay in an, or an elongation of a developmental period, and particularly a period so that you look like a juvenile. So here's an example. The tiger salamander's closest relative is the axolotl, sometimes called the Mexican salamander. Okay, um, and this Mexican salamander shows a very strange adult phenotype. 
Now all of these other salamanders go through a juvenile phase where they have gills, they don't have much pigmentation, they uh, suck oxygen out of the water, and they, they survive in ponds and, and uh, streams and lakes. And all of them, with the exception of the axolotl, then go through a metamorphosis, a lot like a tadpole changing into a frog. These juvenile salamanders, sometimes called mud puppies, I don't know if you're familiar, that's more of a southeastern United States term. But these juvenile salamanders metamorphose into a very different looking adult form that doesn't have gills, has uh, stronger legs, and all these other adaptations that allow them to, to stay on land. However, the Mexican salamander has a mutation and it never goes through that final metamorphosis. It gains its ability to reproduce, but still maintains juvenile features. Now for this Mexican salamander, that was actually a dramatic benefit because these guys live in an area where there's not very much uh, good habitat for adult salamanders. They live in the Cienegas in uh, Mexico and all around them is dry, sometimes even desert uh, habitat. And so if they were changing into adults and trying to live their life on land like these salamanders that are in cooler, wetter climates, they would most likely uh, not be able to survive. And so salamanders that maintained the juvenile features and stayed in the water their entire life did much better. And so that has been selected for and made this species look incredibly different from even its closest relative. So that is a homeotic mutation, a little tiny change results in a dramatic shift in the way the organisms look. Okay, so just know that one example, and then it's an example of patomorphism via neoteny. And we can even, in some ways, turn back that evolutionary clock. So for example, if you take axolotl uh, juveniles, these little baby salamanders, and you artificially induce a metamorphosis. And you can do this by looking at the genes that are turned on and expressed in the tiger salamander. Find those same genes in the Mexican salamander, which remember have mutated so they're no longer turned on. And you manipulate it. You change it a little bit. Okay, we'll look at that in the materials and methods in 3.3 C. But however you, don't worry about how right now, but you turn on those genes where normally they wouldn't be coming on. And sure enough, the Mexican salamander begins to go through a developmental process that looks just like the process found here in this tiger salamander. So Mexican salamanders still have the ability to metamorphose into adults. It's just not being used. And probably, and maybe to some extent this has already happened, but certainly over the generations that occur, there are going to be more and more mutations that will make it less and less uh, easy to kind of go back and artificially induce this event, which is still kind of buried in their genetics somewhere, even though they don't use it. So just one example, there are dozens and dozens of other really great examples of these homeotic shifts that have resulted in a dramatic shift in phenotype, and in some cases, an evolutionary breakthrough. Okay, the last topic that we're going to review for this 3.3a uh, is um, this concept of totipotent and pluripotent cells. So when a egg is first fertilized by a sperm, and for the first several stages after that, so we go through cellular division, usually rather rapidly, but for many of these stages, every single one of these cells maintains the ability and the potential to become any cell in the adult body. And at an early enough stage, not only any cell in the adult body, but any cell in the support structures also. So for like mammals, that would include the placenta and the umbilicus and the amniotic sac, the membrane around the developing embryo. That's a totipotent cell. At a very early stage, the cells that will become the embryo divide from the rest of those support cells. So here in blue we have pluripotent cells. And that would event these group of cells will eventually go on and become a human fetus, or if this isn't a mouse, a mouse fetus, or you know, a chicken or a salamander, or whatever this particular species is. But these cells at a very early stage are pluripotent. So make sure you know the difference. Totipotent is can become any part of the developing embryo or uh, the support cells. And pluripotent, they can become any part of the developing embryo. So after they have uh, separated and defined themselves separately from those support cells. Now there's a common term that for pluripotent and one that's very interesting and that people are working on in the medical field. And this is stem cell. So know that another term for pluripotent is a stem cell, right? And so if we take these early cells 
and give them the right sorts of signals. And we'll talk about those signals here in a little bit. But if we give them the right cells, we can turn these into a heart, a brain, or a nervous cord, immune system, or any of the other, you know, muscle cells, bone cells, you can add all of them. These have the capability. They know how. They have all the instruction manual. And so as the embryo develops, different signals are given to different cells based on where they are in that bundle of cells. And they eventually become locked into one of these cell fates. So after that occurs, in most species, you can't go back. So for instance, if you um, have a skin cell and uh, you've damaged that skin cell, it can grow into more skin cells and can go, can, can go over and heal. And to some, in some cases, there's a little bit of flexibility, but not much. So if you chop off your arm, uh, your body doesn't know how to take those differentiated bone and muscle and skin cells at the end of your arm and turn it back in to a stem cell so that it can grow other cells. Okay, um, but obviously doctors are very, very interested in this because if we could figure out how this occurs, we could, could potentially take pluripotent cells and turn them into any uh, cell in the body. So if you need a heart transplant, we could take pluripotent cells, maybe even from your own body, if we could figure out how to get an adult cell and turn it back into a pluripotent cell, or maybe you have uh, some stem cells saved like from cord blood or other areas. Um, and people are working on this, we've made dramatic progress, but you could potentially take your own cells and turn it into a heart. Now a heart's a pretty complicated structure, and so doing that we're still a long, long ways off from being able to make complicated structures like hearts. But people are working on ways to make perhaps pancreatic cells. So we could potentially cure type 1 diabetes and give you a set of cells that are able to create insulin, right? Or potentially uh, create other tissues that are rather simple. Maybe many, many years down the road even create more complex tissues. So there's dramatic potential. But a developing embryo knows how to do this all on its own. It has all the signals that are required and eventually will become a fully developed form of um, uh, a, a baby born, hatched, and then eventually can, that can grow into a fully formed adult, right? And so the signals that send these pluripotent cells down the different pathways are really, really important, okay? So I'm going to tell you what those signals are, and we realized this fairly early on, that it had to be something in um, the DNA. And the DNA, of course, we know is the signals are coding for genes. Now the genes that we're going to be looking at in uh, developmental uh, EvoDevo is our transcription factors or signaling molecules that have as their end target a transcription factor. So a transcription factor is simply a gene product, a protein, that has the ability to bind to DNA and turn on or turn off the expression of a nearby gene. So you can kind of think these, of these as master control genes that turn on and turn off the expression of other genes. Um, and we'll look at them and how they do that in, in another, uh, I think it's 3.3b, but we'll look at that here in one of the, the next discussions. Okay, So just put transcription factor under this, and transcription factors act by turning on or off different pathways. So with the right transcription factor, I could have a cascade of other genes turned on that would eventually grow a heart. Whereas if I turned on another set of transcription factors, uh, then I would have um, you know, a part of your immune system, like a white blood cell in your bone marrow or something like that. Okay? And so the initial hypothesis for EvoDevo, now we're going to look at this not from a medical perspective. Oh, that's cool. I can cure you know, heart disease or make a transplant or cure diabetes. That's cool too. But we could also use these to understand the differences and the changes, like what makes a fruit fly different from a butterfly. And so the initial hypothesis was that the fruit fly has different genes. And so those genes would turn on and make a fruit fly, whereas if we went to a butterfly, we'd find a different set of developmental genes that go downstream and make a butterfly. Okay, so that was the initial hypothesis. Now, at the end of 3.3d, we will revisit it and see if that initial hypothesis was actually supported. But going into this, as people knew, began to understand genes and identify genes, they said, okay, it's going to be genes in the butterfly are different than genes in the fruit fly, they're different than genes in the mouse and then the human, and we can look at all the different genes and maybe even someday identify and figure out what genes make a fruit fly, what genes make a butterfly, and where all those genes came from. Okay, so that's going to be our starting point. We're going to evaluate that and look at that uh, over the next three discussions.